I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. this one of my favorite songs thank you very much good morning everybody there's a big hole right here I've never noticed that now you're filling it up the way to go <laughs> glad to see everybody thank you for being here it's a beautiful day and a grand opportunity for us to be together and I thank you for joining us here today if this is your first time with us welcome there should be a guest registration card in the pew rack right in front of you and we hope that you will go to that and fill it out if you're joining us via live stream then we hope you'll go to the uh to, to, to that and f fill out whatever you want to and let us know you've been here and we will be in touch with you and give you a proper welcome but we're glad you're here we hope that you will want to be with us in the days that are ahead there are several things going on in our church right now. One of them you might notice is the food drive that we have happening right now. This time of year, we try to do a major food drive every year for the Interfaith Food Pantry and the Christmas store. There is no time of year when people struggle more for food than during the holidays, and so we try to be an answer to that. We are trying, we hope to, we've set a goal anyway of trying to have 5,000 food items that have, that have been donated. You can also give a dollar, and for every dollar you give, that's one food item. And so we count it all together. We have, a, we have been given so far about, a, I think it's 1,036 food items as of early this morning. That is a good number. It's a little behind where we were last year. So I just want to remind everybody of this food drive that we have, and we hope that you will take part in that. Tabby has an announcement for us. Good morning. 
just want to take a minute, thank you so much, um, to make sure that you are aware of what we've got going on at the end of this month. So uh, we are doing another drive-through trunk or treat. We really wanted to provide a way for us to show the community that we love them and that we enjoy celebrating together, but to do it in a way that feels safe and that everybody can feel comfortable. So we are doing another drive-through trunk or treat. Last year we had over 150 kids come through. Pretty good year, especially considering. Um, and this year we're expecting more than that. So that means we need a bunch of people to decorate trunks. We've got some who've signed up already. Um, but we need more than that. And we also need a lot of candy. So you may have noticed on your way in, there was a big old box that some of the kids decorated for us. We really need to fill that up and more. So if you would be looking for candy and bringing it to us here, it can be Sunday, but it can also just be any day of the week. And then also consider if you would be willing to decorate a trunk. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of ideas on the internet for you, or you can ask me. Um, but if you are interested in volunteering for that, please email me at tabby at blacksburgbaptist.org. I would be happy to help you um, and please be bringing out candy so thank you so much yeah we have gathered here to worship and part of that worship is to make sure that our children are part of that we invite our children to come forward time for children's time mm -hmm. you can you can join us too no <laughs> you're good you're good come on there they come there they come. Does anybody know that song the same he's playing? <laughs> Who knew that song? Do you know that song? What is it? Jesus loves me. Play it again, Amy. Please. Sing it with me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Because he does. Good morning. Please don't fall off, Nathaniel. Guess what? I have fallen through that hole before, so don't do that, please. No, you love. Logan wants to see me fall through the hole. Well, thank you. God bless you, son. I love you. Um, welcome. Look, we have a big kid back here. Say hi, Catherine. <laughs> Isn't that cool? You guys doing okay this morning? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. What happened to your arm, Henry? What happened to your arm? What happened? I mean, Sam, I'm sorry. You fell off the monkey bar, Sam. I'm sorry, bud. Did that hurt pretty bad? Oh, I'm so sorry. You're going to get better, though, right? Yeah, okay. So we're going to pray for you. No, no, no. I just want to show you guys some stuff, and, and then, yeah, you'll probably want it, too. So, ever been thirsty? Raise your hand. Really thirsty, like, oh, I think I'm going to die. I'm so thirsty. So, I've got some things. I'm going to set them down here. Let's just not touch them for now. Anybody know what that is? Gatorade. Gatorade. Love Gatorade. Do you? And, of course, here's, here's some Gatorade Zero if you're watching your figure, your weight, you know. You want to be nice and thin. And then, <laughs> Coke, Coke, Coke. Everybody knew what that was. Isn't that so good? What's in that that's so good anyway? Sugar. Sugar. Okay. Oh, it's so, it's so, so good. And then I've got something. Who said boring? Water is not boring. No, water's, water's awesome. Yeah, Ron Green and I were talking about that, how water, water is awesome. You could drink sugar all day? Oh, oh, you mean you put sugar in the water and nobody would know? Yeah, okay, mom and dad, Isaiah has an idea that he would put sugar in the water. There's dad right there. Check his water, okay? Because you learned that from school. Well, good, good. That's what, they're, that's what they're teaching in school. Okay, so thirsty. Sometimes we reach for Gatorades. You may know what an electrolyte is. You don't need to. But it really, if you're, if you're doing sports, you're running, you're sweating, Gatorade's really, really good. And, and again, if, if, you want, uh, if you want some Gatorade, but you don't want the calories of the sugar, and then you drink this, but you guys don't have to worry about calories. Y'all are just really, really good. And if you just, hmm, I mean, is this really good for us? It's not. It's really not, is it? I mean, it tastes really good, but this is not good for us. Um, folks, if you're really, really thirsty, the best thing is water, isn't it? 
Do you know your body is mostly made of water? Yeah, your Gatorade's best. I mean, I love it. It's good. But, but water's best. Boys and girls, it reminds me of a story. Listen, there's this story about Jesus being tired. And, you know, we've talked about this, that Jesus has had every feeling you've ever had. And he was tired. He was worn out. He was thirsty. He was walking. And he came to this well. It was probably about noon, really hot outside, and the sun's beating down. And he goes up to this well. And nobody's around except this one woman. She's by herself, Logan. She's a pretty lonely lady, and she went at 12 o'clock because she knew nobody else would be there. She didn't want to see anybody. She's lonely, didn't have friends. But there's Jesus, and Jesus says, I'm really tired and thirsty. Can you get me some water? And she thought, well, this is odd. This man is talking to me, but okay, she's going to get him some water. And then do you know what Jesus said about that water and that well? Jesus said, woman... If you knew who I was, the one asking you for a drink, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you water that is so good you'll never, ever, ever be thirsty again. Can you guys imagine? Water's so good she'd never be thirsty again. And then he said, and it's, it's so good that it will become in you a separate living well of water that just keeps producing more and more living water. Not like that old stone well that you're drawing water of. That woman said, give me this water. That sounds like what I've been wanting and needing. Give me this water. Who, who'd that man turn out to be? Jesus. Jesus, God was right there with her. God was offering her something that is better than Gatorade, Gatorade Zero, Coke, and even better than this water, because if I drink this water, I'm going to be thirsty again, right? Was Jesus talking about just her body being thirsty? No. Jesus knew she was thirsty for friendship and understanding and love and forgiveness. All the things that she was thirsty for was, were found in Jesus. Boys and girls, listen to me. When you're thirsty... Not, not for a drink, but, but when you need something, God knows your need. If you're lonely, if you need an extra dose of joy or happiness, if, you, if you're afraid and you need to be calm and peaceful, or if you forgot how special you are and you need to be reminded, guess who'll tell you? Jesus, every time. Do you know that? Everything you need is found in Jesus. Will you trust him? Let's pray about it. God, thank you. Thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for their energy and their knowledge. And thank you that they want to know you and they want to love you more. And thank you that you first loved them, us. You have loved us. And, oh, God, how you love us. Thank you for forgiving us of our, our sins, all our mistakes you've covered. And you've shown us a better way to live. Point us in your direction. Help us to, help us to receive that water from you that that takes care of our every need, just like you did for that lady so long ago. And then, God, help us to tell our friends about you, that in you they can find everything. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, drink lots of water. No sugar, no sugar. Good morning, church. You ready to worship, sing some praises, lift his name? Let's stand. God above all our hopes and fears I don't care what the world throws at me now I'm gonna be alright Hear the sounds of the generations Making loud our freedom song All in all 
that the world may know your name. It's gonna be all right, cause I know my God saved the day, and I know his word never fails, and I know. Salvation is here. God above, put the world in motion. God above, all our hopes and fears. And I don't care what the world throws at me now. It's going to be all right, because I know. God save the day, and I know His word never fails, and I know my God made a way for me. It's gonna be alright, cause I know my God save the day, and I know His word never fails, and I know Salvation is here. Salvation that died just to set me free. Salvation is here. Salvation is here and He lives in me. Salvation is here. Cause you are alive and you live in me. Salvation is here. Salvation is here and He lives in me. Salvation is here. Cause you are alive and you live in me. Cause I know my God saved the day and I know His word never fails. And I know my God made a way for me. It's gonna be all right, cause I know my God saved the day, and I know His word never fails, and I know my God made a way for me. Salvation is here, salvation is here, and He lives in me. Salvation is here. Cause you are alive and you live in me. Amen. I think every time we sing this song, I probably say the same thing. I, gosh, man, I love this song. It's just a song of, of recommitment, a song of submission. It's a song to humble. No. 
heartbeat of my life is to worship in your life because your glory is so beautiful your glory is so beautiful Praise your name. We lift you above all else. Glory to God in the highest. Father, how good it feels to be in your presence. Father, how joyful it feels to know you are here. God, we submit. We surrender. God, my life is yours. 
Father, whatever it is that is keeping me from you, whatever it is in my life that is distracting me today, now, I lift to you. God, it is yours. Mold me, shape me, create in me a clean heart. Father, so that I may carry out your plan, so that I may walk the path you set before me, God, so that others can see you in me. God, we say it every Sunday. It is good to come together and worship. It is better to take it outside these walls. God, help me to be the person that you've called me to be so that I can spread your glory, so that I can build the kingdom, God, so that I don't deprive other people the chance of seeing your face. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, you are good. God, we move now from worship into teaching. Open our hearts, stir our souls. Let your spirit move in us, among us, and around us, God, so that we can hear what it is we need to hear and take action on it so that we can praise your name every day, every minute, every second. Help you be visible in us, God. It is in your name we pray. obstacles that on our own we cannot overcome. So we need to travel well. We need to follow Christ so we don't stray from the path. His word has to be our compass, always pointing us in the right direction. Because without him, we are lost. In following his guidance, we have peace and we experience His beauty and goodness. We find joy in His presence. And in following Him, we will never be led astray. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 7, beginning with verse 6. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him, and with a brazen face she said, Today I fulfilled my vows, and I have food from my house offering at home, from my fellowship offering at home. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Because this particular verse is something we won't have a lot of time to look at in the sermon, but it's important. What we need to realize is this woman that Solomon's talking about is a religious woman. She is an individual who goes to the temple. She went to the temple and made her sacrifices before. A lot of us can be very religious and still be off track. Now, back to the scripture. So I came out to meet you. I cooked for, I looked for you and I have found you. I have covered my bed with with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money, and he will not be home 
till full moon. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once, she, he followed her like an ox to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. The word of the Lord. Not always easy to give thanks for the word of the Lord, is it? <laughs> Especially when it's one that can be convicting. I'm starting a new series today. It's called The Path. I'm basing this on Andy Stanley's book, The Principle of the Path, How to Get from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. When I start something new, I always want to know something about it. If I decide I want to go to a movie, I want to know something about the movie before I go. If I don't, I never end up exactly where I would like to end up. I don't know if any of you have ever seen The Life of Pi, but I got talked into going to see The Life of Pi. It lasted five hours and 37 minutes. At least that's how it felt. I went to see Frozen. That only lasted 30 minutes because I went to sleep after 10 minutes and woke up during the last 20 minutes of the movie. If I don't know something about the movie before I go, I'm usually going to mess something up. I'm starting something new today. I want you to know something about it. So let me tell you a little bit about the book of Proverbs as we get started here. In ancient Israel, there were three groups of people who wrote to the people of Israel. They wrote to the people on behalf of God. The first group were the priests. They were the ones who gave the law. The second group were the prophets, and the prophets gave direction and correction to the people. The third group were the sages, and they gave counsel. Proverbs, Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon were all written by the sages. Bible scholars call these books wisdom literature. If you have intelligence, then, then you know things. If you have wisdom, then you know how to act in various situations of life. And take my word for it, you can be highly intelligent in life and still not have wisdom. Mark Zuckerberg is an extremely intelligent guy. He's built a billion-dollar empire on Facebook and Instagram, but... It would be hard-pressed to call the guy wise, and, and the reality is, is his lack of wisdom is right now costing him, certainly in the court of public opinion, and it's probably going to cost him legally before it is over. Wisdom literature was written to try to make us wise. It's written to try to help us to know what to do in specific situations and how to carry that through. The book of Proverbs was primarily written by, the, by King Solomon, and Solomon was purported to have been the wisest man who ever lived at that point in time of his life. 1 Kings 4, 32 through 34 says, Solomon spoke 3,000 Proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Of course, the world that they knew about at that time were the, world, the, the kingdoms right around Israel, but he was still an extremely wise individual. Solomon wrote most of the book of Proverbs. Chapter 20, chapters 25 through 31 were written by other people as a tribute to Solomon. Now, I hope you were taking notes on all of that because it will be on the test. The point of the book of Proverbs and the point of this series is the road you take is going to determine where you end up. If you go north on Main Street long enough, you're going to end up eventually in West Virginia. If you go south on Main Street long enough, you're going to end up eventually in a cow pasture in Floyd County. The road that you take is going to determine where you end up. And that piece of knowledge takes us to the principle of the path. Your direction, not your intention, determines your destination in life. That's obvious when you're dealing with geography. You can just pull out a map and realize that. But it's not as obvious when you're dealing with the issues and the struggles of life. 
I had someone come to me who was lamenting how their life had turned out, lamenting the struggles that they were having in their lives. When they told me their story and told me the decisions that they had made, I found myself thinking, how did you not know this was coming? You made every wrong decision, and yet you still thought you were going to end up in the right place. How did you manage to do that? Let me point out, this person is highly intelligent. They are a brilliant individual, but they're not a wise individual. They made bad choices over and over again, and yet they're shocked that their life is not going where they want it to go. That's what happens when you're not wise, and that's the point of the Scripture that I've just read to you a minute ago. We don't know if this scripture was, even was a literal scripture or if it's just allegorical. We know part of it's allegorical, but we don't know whether Solomon actually saw somebody doing this or whether it was a composite of his observation of life and then he created this story to make his point. What we do know is that this story illustrates the principle that we are looking at today just about as well as any scripture you'd want to find. I saw a young man who had no sense. His name was Tommy. He was going down the street near her corner. Then out came a woman to meet him. She was dressed like a prostitute and she had crafty intent. Now pay attention to this. This woman may have been looking for this young man, but this young man was definitely looking for this woman. This woman's husband was out of town. Apparently, the young man knew it, and so he went looking for her. He lo went looking for something special. He went looking for something that he could brag to his friends about. It's been, if this had been today, and this kid had been looking for a theme song, it would have probably have been this theme song. This kid was ready to sow some wild oats and he thought he had found the field for the wild oats. In the meantime, King Solomon is looking out his window and he sees this kid going down the street and if the king had had a theme song for this, it would have probably been this. <laughs> Every time I hear that song, I start to get a little bit of an itch up my spine. Solomon knew what was going to happen to this young man. The teenager thought that he was about to have a really exciting night, one really exciting event that was going to be disconnected to anything else in his life. But Solomon knew very well that this was a step down a path. And that path was going to lead somewhere that this kid really didn't want to go even though he didn't understand that. In all likelihood, this was going to be the first step in a very long and painful journey in his life. But that kid could not see that to save his life. She took hold of him and kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, Let's drink of love till morning. If that kid had been looking for a theme song for that moment in his life, this is probably what it would have been. <laughs> I've just got to say, folks, this was every teenage boy's dream. Every teenage boy in the world has some dream like this one. If Solomon had started yelling at that kid going down the street and told him not to go, if Solomon had started yelling, stop with all of his power, there's not a chance in the world that that kid would have stopped because this kid knew what he wanted and this woman told him that she had made it right with God. I have fulfilled my vows. I made my fellowship offering. Don't worry, kid. I prayed about it. This is fine. We know a lot of people who have done that in their lives. We even know leaders of nations that have done that. We know the leader of one nation that did it for sure. Do we all remember Bill Clinton? <laughs> Bill Clinton was an individual who made a bad choice, and the worst part of his story, in my opinion, was that he tried to justify it with Scripture. How do you do that in your life? But people do that. We all have a tendency to do that. It's amazing what we can justify with Scripture if we 
just try to throw God in the mix of something. The Ku Klux Klan terrorized the black community from 18, the 1870s to the 1970s. They used the Bible every step of the way to try to justify their hatred and their prejudice. The Christian church in the South supported slavery for 200 years, and then they supported segregation for another 100 years, and they used the Bible every day of it. Hear this, folks. You can justify anything by using the Bible, but you can't justify anything by standing with Jesus. If you walk with Jesus, there are just certain things we cannot justify, so we need to start with Jesus, not just shoehorn him into things. This woman was wanting to justify herself, and so she made an offering at the temple to try to square it all with God. She kept her religious obligations, and now she was about to go on about her business. If she could fit God into this situation, surely it would all be fine, but Solomon knew it wasn't fine. With persuasive words, she led him astray. And he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, like a bird darting into a snare. Solomon knew both of these people were making choices that were going to be fun for them, but those choices were going to wreck their futures and it could possibly wreck their lives. Back in that day, there was no such thing as antibiotics, so they could end up being miserable the rest of their lives, or they could die. But those people weren't thinking about the consequences. They weren't thinking about any of that. This was a one-time event. It was just between them. How could this be a problem? But that's when Solomon turns a corner with this teaching. It's when he heads a different direction than what we had expected him to go. He starts addressing not just those two people, but he suddenly starts addressing everybody. It's what some people tell ministers when we start addressing everybody. They say, we've gone to meddling. That's what Solomon had done here. Now then, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her path. There's the word, folks. The word is path. This wasn't an event. This was a path. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain is a mighty throng. She in this story is not just the woman. She is sin. She is temptation. She is the one thing in life that can lead us to get off track and to start heading down the wrong path without even thinking about it. This allegory isn't about this boy and this woman. It's about us. This boy is a symbol of human temptation, and this woman is a symbol of everything that, that we want that doesn't honor God. Solomon used a sexual encounter here to make his point because he knew that's one thing that everybody is tempted by. It applies to everybody. Everybody isn't tempted by power. We aren't all tempted by greed or pride or anger, but everybody is tempted by sex. Sex and hunger are the two most powerful and most universal human instincts. <clears throat> and so sex and gluttony are two sins that are going to invade everybody's lives. Solomon used sex because he wanted to make sure everybody knew that he's talking to everybody. He isn't just talking to two people. He isn't just talking about one situation. He's talking to everybody. This allegory isn't about sex. It's about the path. Her house is a highway to the grave. It leads to the chambers of death. This story is about choosing. It's about choosing the right path. Will we choose the road that leads to life or will we choose the road that leads to death? Several years ago, I was <coughs> out with the police one night. They made a traffic stop. There was a young man that they took into custody that night. He was high on both drugs and alcohol. His teeth were rotted where he had been smoking crack cocaine. We got back to the police department. I stuck up, struck up a conversation with that young man. And <clears throat> the longer we talked, the, the more he revealed. And finally, he said, several years ago, I was at a party and I smoked crack cocaine one time and I was hooked. He said, I made one bad choice in one night and it turned my life to crap, and it's been crap ever since. It's the path. 
What path are we going to choose? And take my word for it, it's not just about the big decisions, things like drugs or booze or all the other stuff. It's about deciding how we're going to live and, and, and who we're going to be in the everyday of our lives. There isn't a person alive who isn't going to be tempted to go down the wrong road sometime. There isn't a person alive who isn't going to be tempted to go where God doesn't want them to go. And if you don't believe that, think about this. A single person came to me and said, someday I want to marry a Christian person that's got their act together, and yet they date whoever they find attractive, whether they believe in God or not. Seven or eight years ago, I had a young woman come to me. She wanted me to perform her wedding right after she asked me to do her wedding, and I said yes. She said, I want you to know right now I'm counting on you to lead my fiancé to Jesus. Believe it or not, I've had more than one do that over the years. I looked at her and I said, why didn't you start with Jesus? If you'd started with Jesus, that sentence wouldn't have even been important. I had a husband and a father come to me and he said, I want my kids to grow up and respect me as a husband and a father and, and a Christian person. But the problem with that is, is this guy flirts with every woman that he meets, whether his children are there or not, whether I'm there, whether anybody else is. He, it's so automatic with him, he doesn't even think about it. About a month ago, I had somebody ask me how I had lost so much weight. And so I told them, and he said, I'd like to lose some weight and get more fit. And that would have been great if he hadn't been standing with a supersized meal from McDonald's. A young Christian said, I want to have a deeper relationship with God. So they get up every morning, they go to the gym, which is great. But then they come home and they get on social media and they stay on that for an hour before they go to work instead of having at least a 15-minute quiet time with Jesus. Somebody asked me just this past week why I write a devotional every day. And I said, because it focuses me on God and at least on one verse of Scripture for 30 minutes a day. And then I get the privilege of sharing what I've learned with the people around me. If you want to have a deeper relationship with God, spend some time with Him. What's the point of this list I've just given? The point is everybody I have just mentioned are people with the best of intentions. There's not a person in this list who has an evil intent in their heart, but they're still on the wrong path. They've come to a fork in the road and they've chosen the wrong direction without giving it much thought, and that's the problem. It doesn't take something big to tempt us to take the wrong path, and we're all vulnerable to this. And that was Solomon's point. There's something that can get all of us off track. So we need to, to ask, what are the disconnects in our lives? What are the discrepancies between the, way, the things we should want and the things that we actually do want and the way we actually do live? What are our intentions in life and what is the direction that we need to go? A couple of years ago, I did a funeral in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia, and, and when I got through, I was coming back. The GPS told me to take a turn. I took the turn. It told me to take another turn, and I took that turn. I have no idea where I ended up when the GPS finally just cut off. There wasn't a house in sight. I, there was nothing around but one pasture and, and, and mountains. I did not know what to do. The only thing I knew for sure was I was lost. And the only choice I had was to try to backtrack every turn that I had made until I got to something that I recognized. If you get lost on the highway, you can backtrack and find your way back. But if you get lost in life, you can't backtrack your life. You can lose an entire season of life, an entire season of happiness by going the wrong direction with your life. And nobody wants that. So what can we do to try to prevent getting lost? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to ask, what direction am I going with my life? What direction am I going morally? What direction am I going relationally with friends and family? What direction am I going financially with my life? Most importantly, what direction am I going spiritually? And pay attention to this. Our spiritual life is the key here. If our spiritual life is what it needs to be, the spiritual is going to guide the rest of our story. It will make us stop and ask ourselves the questions we need to ask. If Jesus is truly the center of our lives, 
He's going to set the tone for the rest of our existence. The second thing that we need to do to keep from getting lost is we need to make our choices based on the long term and not just the short term. That's what Solomon was trying to get across to this young man. Make your choices based on where you want to be out in the future, not just what you want to do right now. We need to see life as steps to a destination and not just a, a bunch of unrelated events. And third, we need to try to walk with God and we need to try to pray to God for God to guide us in our lives. Proverbs 8, 1 and 2. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths of life meet, wisdom takes her stand. The Hebrew word for wisdom was Sophia, and it was a characteristic of God. What this is saying is, at the junctions of life, at, at, at the where the paths are meeting, God is standing there. And the best parts of his character is there to meet with us. Wisdom is one of those. He's going to take his stand right where we are. What are we going to do with God's stand? This was Solomon's way of saying God is calling to us. Always, every moment, wherever you are in life, God is standing at the intersection of right and wrong. Choose God and choose life. Let's pray together. Holy God, I come to you today because I know very well that I've come to the intersections of life and made the wrong choices. I've come to the intersections of life and gone the direction I wanted to go instead of the direction you would have me go. I've even done that when I could even hear your voice calling to me saying, there's something wrong, don't do this. And yet, went right on and made the wrong choice. All of us are going to be tempted to do that, Lord. So help us to try to focus our hearts and our minds on you. Help us to want you to be the center of our existence. Help us to want you to be the love of our lives. Help us to want you to be the one who would lead us and guide us. Help us to have the courage, O oh Lord, to stop right now and to evaluate ourselves and to say, Lord, I need you to come into my life. I want you to be part of my existence. I want you to be the one who lives inside me and who takes control of me and who, who shows me the directions that I need to go. I want you to be the top priority of my existence. So I am asking you, Lord, to come into my life. Forgive me for trying to push you aside and, and to want you to be sitting over on the side while I make my decisions. Come, Lord, and live within me and be the wisdom of my life. Help me to try to be the best that I know how to be. Help me to try to love you in ways that I would never imagine loving you. And help me to know more than anything that you love me and you want nothing but the best for me. Come, Lord Jesus, and live inside my soul. And help me to become the person you dreamed of me being. Help us, Lord, to pray that prayer today. And help us to try to walk in your footsteps because you will not lead us astray. In your name we pray. Amen. what the mercy of God can do if you knew me then you'd believe me now he turned my whole life upside down he took the old and he made it new it's what the mercy of God can do now I'm alive to tell the story How I've overcome It's His goodness and mercy And the power of His blood I'm so glad that my freedom 
wasn't based on what I've done, but His goodness and mercy and the power of the blood. Father, I remember the wrong path and what happened when I met you. God, there are people in this sanctuary that have known you all their lives, and they remember how when they took the wrong path, Father, you brought them back into the fold. Father, we are awed, awed of the never-ending mercy, awed of the grace that just continues to pour out, humbled of the infinite, infinite forgiveness, God. Father, we worship you, we lift your name, we praise you, we glorify you, we thank you for everything that you have created in us. Father, we stand and sing together, was the cross. Was the cross meant for me that my sin? the grave meant for me where my sin lay buried now I stand redeemed by the mercy of God was the cross meant for me that 
you've come here today and you've chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ, we'll be here at the front of the servants, at the front of the church, and we'll wait for you. We hope that you'll come and want to be baptized into the faith. If you want to join our church and be part of our mission, we would love to have you. If you'll come, we'll help you with that. Let's go from this place today and let's leave this building of worship and let's go out to be the church. And let's do everything we can to try to walk the right path and to try to bring as many with us as we can. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you, folks.